Westside is honored to host the chair of Christian Thought Iwasa Lectures on Urban Theology this evening. And tonight we're led by two panelists, Dr. Douglas Shantz and Dr. David Dick. Dr. Doug Shantz has been a professor of Christian studies for over 30 years, most recently at the University of Calgary, where he serves in the Department of Classics and Religion, as well as heading up the chair of Christian Thought. Tonight, he'll be presenting perspectives on wealth from Reformation, Puritan, and German pietist schools of thought. And I'm going to allow him to introduce our other guest this evening. So on behalf of Westside, Dr. Doug Shantz and Dr. Dick, we're so glad to have you. Would you join me in welcoming our panelists this evening? Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you, Adam. And it is a, a pleasure to be at Westside Kings again. Um, how many remember the Christian Thought event, the lecture by Molly Worthen just a few years ago? Were any of you here for that? A few, I see a few hands. So this is the second occasion that we've, that your church has kindly hosted us, and I appreciate that. Um, Bob Osborne and Adam asked if I would say a little bit about the chair. Um, this is a, quite a unique position that I, I'm privileged to hold at the University of Calgary. I previously taught at Trinity Western University, and people would ask me, why would you leave uh, Trinity Western and, and come to the University of Calgary, this God-forsaken place, kind of, that was implied by the question, I guess. But uh, this is a, a unique opportunity, uh, I think, to this position, because it involves not only the usual teaching at the university, but it involves this kind of thing, uh, a roster of lecture events that encourage Christians to think about their faith in practical ways that relate to our culture and our society and issues that we're all trying to address today. So that's the vision of the chair. It began back in the 80s. I did not begin this position. I inherited it. And it's proved to be a, a wonderful uh, calling, uh, I would say, coming to Calgary to serve in this role. Uh, I do teach at the University of Calgary. I teach courses in the history of Christianity. This winter, I'll be teaching a course on Christian autobiography. Um, the present term, I'm teaching Medieval and Reformation Christianity. Uh, I have a PhD student who's actually here tonight, and she is doing her PhD thesis on Luther and women, which I think is an interesting topic, and uh, at least she finds it interesting. Uh, <clears throat> so those are the kinds of things that, that keep me busy. Um, why this topic tonight? Why this issue, Christians and wealth, Christians and money? Uh, some of you may know that for four years in succession, I've hosted a panel around the topic of poverty and homelessness. Back in January 2012 at um, Grace Presbyterian, John Rook spoke about the ethics of homelessness and programs that work. And then a year later, January 2013, we had a panel that included John Rook and Bishop Henry, and actually a man who had lived in a homeless situation, John Bodman, who had been homeless for years. And then a year after that, in February 2014, we had a panel on homeless youth in Calgary, including Stasha Huntingford, who is a PhD student in social work at U of C, and actually lived uh, as a homeless herself for years as a teenager. And then just last February, uh, we had a panel on poverty in Calgary, strategies, issues, challenges, and strategies. I hope some of you took in some of those events. So I guess my point is, in a sense, this is following up on that, at least in my mind it is. And now we're addressing from a more positive perspective, what does it mean as a Christian person to have wealth? Is it legitimate to seek wealth? And if one is successful in getting it, what are we supposed to do with it? What is a Christian way of being wealthy? Uh, those are some of the issues that we're going to look at uh, this evening. I'm honored to be joined by a colleague at the University of Calgary, Dr. David Dick. And uh, David is in the philosophy department, uh, but he also uh, has a role in the Haskane School of Business in their Center for Advanced Leadership in Business. So he has a very unique position as well at the University of Calgary. And initially, when I had David in mind for this event, he held the chair in business ethics. So I thought, well, let's get the chairs together. Christian thought, business ethics, and um, 
So that, that's where this vision came from, to, in, to include David, and I'm delighted that Dr. David Dick has agreed to be part of our presentation this evening. As you know, usually these events come in twos, and so if you're free tomorrow noon hour uh, in the Rosé Center in the Scotiabank Milling area, uh, David Dick will speak on Locke's theory of property. And if that topic doesn't bring you out, nothing will. Um, so, uh, in planning these events, I should maybe add that I work with an advisory council of Calgary Christians from various denominations. Uh, some of those gentlemen are, are with us tonight. And it's their job to kind of keep me relevant and keep these topics interesting. And uh, I plan these events with input from the advisory council uh, to the chair. Um, how the, now, you've heard how this will proceed tonight, so maybe I'll just get started. I'll try to speak for less than half an hour so I can give David more than half an hour. Um, just to re remind you, our topic is money and religious virtue. Um, I'm going to give more of an historical background going back to the Middle Ages. And then uh, David is going to speak about the prosperity gospel, which I, I think well, I, I can hardly wait to hear about that. My hope is that as we... we as we look at how Christians, from various perspectives, have, have addressed this issue of wealth, it might get us thinking about our own approach to this important topic. Um, I'm sure your pastors have reminded you that Jesus spoke a lot about material things. There's a lot in the New Testament about wealth. And so this is a, this is a topic that Christians ought to be thinking about. And I hope that we can stimulate your thinking. In a classic book entitled Religion and the Rise of Capitalism, R.H. Taney made some observations that have stimulated my thinking this evening. And among those observations is simply that during this thousand-year period that we call the Middle Ages, Christian morality governed Christian economic behavior very strictly. There were very clear expectations and rules for how Christians managed their wealth. Tony makes the observation by the 17th century that situation had almost entirely disappeared. There was a kind of individualism that, that included Christians and the expectations around wealth had been lost. I mean, partly that was because of the Reformation. Um, and with the Reformation came this loss of, of Christendom, the loss of a unified society in the West around Catholic Christian expectations. And Tony observes that by the 17th century, you have a largely secular society. And then in England, this happened earliest, swiftest, and with the greatest completeness. This relative secularism. People free to almost make up their own minds in the areas of Christianity and wealth. So I want to look at that trajectory. What happened between the Middle Ages, where there were such strict rules that governed Christians' use of their wealth, to the 17th century where there's this relative individualism and freedom for Christian people, and of course, uh, probably similar to what we have today. So I want to talk about that, how this change came about. So let's go back uh, to the Middle Ages, this thousand-year period between 500 and 1500. Has anybody ever thought about why we call it the Middle Ages? It's a highly prejudicial interpretation that the Renaissance dreamed up to describe a period they didn't like. In the 14th century Renaissance, the, the idea was we are learning to think. We are discovering knowledge in such a new and dramatic way. The only other period that we can really respect was the ancient period of Plato and Aristotle and the Roman Empire. And between that ancient period and themselves and the Renaissance, they saw little of value. And they decided to call this thousand-year period this middle age period uh, between two important periods. Highly prejudicial and I think largely inaccurate. But that's just for your interest where the term comes from. During the Middle Ages, in the Catholic Middle Ages in the West, there were two basic assumptions about wealth and, 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 and material things. One assumption was we must be careful that we are not distracted in our attraction to material things from more important things, especially our soul's salvation. So there's a strict 
hierarchy of values and loves. You must always love God, and you must always seek your salvation, your life with God, in advance of any this-worldly concern. That was principle number one. Principle number two is that we must observe very strict guidelines in terms of how we use those material things so we don't switch those priorities. What were some of those guidelines? Well, one was this notion of the just price. I mean, some of these ideas, I think, are almost laughable to us today, but they were taken for granted as almost the order of nature in the Middle Ages. There was a notion of the just price. In selling goods, um, a craftsman or a, uh, anybody or even a farmer who was selling their goods had to charge a price that was fixed, that was already set. You were not free to set the price of your goods. You charged a price that whatever your goods were, as a merchant or a farmer, whatever, your, whatever price you might want to set was already fixed by either public authority or common estimation, communis estimatio. There was kind of a, a given agreement that you were well aware of, of what a proper price would be for your article that you were selling. How did they arrive at this price? Well, they would take into account the work that you had to put in to produce this article that you were selling and the costs, so the, the, the effort, the time, and also the costs that you yourself had accrued. And that would be taken into account. You had to recover those costs, obviously, and be paid for your work. That was obvious. But beyond that, um, another factor would be that you would not want, expect to become rich. You'd be content through the selling of your, of your articles to gain the necessities of life that were suitable for your station. You would just want to get by. You would be happy if you could feed your family and get by. That would be all that you would expect. Uh, there's a famous uh, expression of this philosophy that comes from John Wycliffe. The person who was poor yesterday and rich today must be wicked. They must be breaking the rules. They must be charging too much or behaving unfairly, undercutting their neighbor. The person who's poor yesterday and rich today must be wicked. The idea of a middleman who would sell, who would buy something cheap and, tr and then sell it for a lot to make a big profit was considered to be a great sinner. And would have to, if he was caught, he'd have to pay alms out of that extra amount that he had, had gained. So that's one guideline, the just price. Another guideline, of course, was the prohibition of usury, of interest taking. No one could charge pure interest. You could not fix an interest payment in advance for a loan. Of course, people loaned each other money or articles or seed or whatever it might be. The loans were made, but you would not set in advance uh, a return because you did know, not know what the fortunes would be. You wouldn't know what the weather would be like, what the crop would be like, what the return would be like. You just couldn't predict that. And so it was beyond acceptable to set in advance a proper rate of return on a loan. Of course, another guideline in the Middle Ages, in the Catholic Middle Ages, was the giving of alms. Uh, there was an expectation that out of whatever uh, material goods you had, you would willingly share those, especially with the poor, in what is called alms. And uh, as one scholar makes clear, the focus was never on improving the situation of the poor. The focus actually was on the benefits that came from the giver because that was considered one of the best good works that one could use to, to show one's Christianity by, by, by giving wealth, out of your wealth, in this way. So the economic, this economic reality was preached from pulpits, emphasizing confessionals, and enforced through courts. These guidelines were not optional. Uh, you could pay a huge stiff price uh, materially and spiritually if you didn't follow these guidelines. So I guess I would sum up by saying that with this worldview in the Middle Ages, great wealth was a sign of materialism. It was, wealth was a danger not worth risking, a danger to your soul that was not worth risking. Obviously, there would be exceptions to this, princes who were called by God to, to have the rule and to have great material responsibility, but those people were few and far between. These rules are for your ordinary uh, Christian. And for the ordinary Christian, wealth was not something you would want. You would not seek for riches because it was too much of a threat to your soul's salvation. 
Now, having given these general principles, we can make a more specific case as it applies to the monastic communities, to the Benedictines, for example. We have a great biography of St. Benedict from Gregory the Great. And for him, Benedict was this great model Christian. Um, and of course, Benedict wrote this wonderful rule that for centuries has guided people who have lived the monastic life. Now, as you may know, uh, the monastic ideals, especially as Benedict described them, had to do with humility, silence, and obedience. And uh, I love the prologue to Benedict's rule because he, there he actually says, and this goes against a lot of Protestant propaganda, he says, if you are serious about your Christianity, if you are willing to actually wage war with sin, then come join us. And throughout the centuries of the Middle Ages, it was the most talented and idealistic young people that would join these monastic communities because they were serious. Uh, they were serious about the Christian ideals. They wanted to put them in the practice. And uh, Benedictines attracted those kind of people. Now, if you look at what the rule says about material things, it's even more strict than the rules I've just given you. Uh, for Benedict, the, the conditions for living in God's kingdom are humility and obedience. And if we wish to reach the peak of humility, Benedict says, we need to accept poverty, right? Poverty, chastity, and obedience. We need to accept poverty. The vice of private ownership must be uprooted. All things are to be held in common by and for everyone. So it's not only wealth that is materialism and a sin, now even private ownership of any kind for the monk was a sin, was unacceptable. For the person who was focused on spiritual things, to be caught up in the ownership of material things was just a big distraction, not worth it. And so you avoided it. So poverty is the virtue. And commerce and ownership are signs of materialism. So now we come rapidly to the 16th century into a man named Martin Luther. Uh, Mar Martin Luther's contribution was to remove this great exaltation of poverty. And poverty functioned as an important reality in the Middle Ages. Being poor was a quasi-virtue. Giving to the poor was a virtue. Luther undercut that whole system, if you will. He denied that poverty itself was a virtue and denied that, that, that good works in and of themselves would get you salvation. We, we know the theology of the Reformation, justification by faith through grace. So poverty no longer serves this great function. It doesn't serve anyone. The poor don't have any special sanctity for Luther. And the rich are not saved by giving alms to the poor. So the whole system is now undercut. Luther, however, did not neglect the issue of wealth and the issue of poverty. Because, of course, there was still lots of poverty in the 16th century. What he did do was call upon churches to pool their resources to serve mainly two groups of people that he thought were deservedly poor. And that would be poor who were impoverished through no fault of their own, sick and disabled people. We've got to keep in mind we don't have Tommy Douglas social safety net in the 16th century, right? So uh, people who are sick, people who are disabled, students, tradesmen who have suffered an accident that can no longer apply their trade. There would be lots of situations where people through no fault of their own were cast into desperation, were desperately poor along with their families. Those people deserve to be helped, said Luther. Another category would be the marginalized, the poor stranger, maybe spouses and children endangered by a drunken father, or maybe the mother had separated or divorced the father and they were left destitute. They were legitimately poor and should be helped. Prisoners and their families could be helped. So the bottom line is that poverty is not automatically a virtue in this system. We've moved away from this thousand-year logic of poverty and alms with the Reformation. Now with Calvin, we move, I would say, a step even further than Luther um, in the direction of, of our modern economic attitudes. Calvinism appealed to city dwellers. 
Calvinism was spread by traders, merchants, workmen, the wealthy. Calvin had no problem with merchants be, becoming crazy wealthy through their hard work, through their ingenuity as merchants, whatever. For Calvin, the profits of trade were legitimate, and he put no limit on what those profits might be. They were, the, the, the merchant was as deserving of these profits he might earn as, as any other trademan was, tradesman was in, in his earnings and his profits. And Calvin, again, like Luther, did not see poverty as especially meritorious. Calvin was concerned about motives and attitudes. The wealthy merchant should be working as unto God, not simply to become rich. Wealth could be a benefit, a result of being a skilled and hardworking merchant. It shouldn't be his main goal. The merchant should be working to honor God in his work, and if wealth came with that hard work to honor God, then that was fine. And furthermore, the wealth should not be used for self-indulgence. One should not use one's worth were, uh, wealth selfishly, according to Calvin. So, two issues there. What's the motive, and what are you doing with the wealth? Those things concern Calvin, but wealth in itself uh, was not bad. It, it could well be a sign of God's blessing. It's the motive that is the interest here. Again, for Calvin, usury is not a problem. Uh, Calvin did retain some medieval ideas. You wouldn't want to give high interest, charge a high interest rate to a poor person. You'd want to take into account their difficult situation. So that was part of Calvin's approach as well. So uh, just to summarize Calvin, wealth is not a sign of materialism necessarily, and poverty is not a virtue. Wealth could well be a sign of hard work and Christian character, depending on the motive and how you used your wealth. Now that brings us to um, the English Puritans. And... Uh, they are a very interesting group. Um, what is Puritanism? I wonder how many of you have an idea of what we're talking about with Puritanism. Uh, the Puritans were Calvinists. And in England, they were a people that became very, under Elizabeth I, became very aggressive in wanting their church in England to be more like Calvin's Geneva. They looked at the Anglican church, and said, this church is still way too Catholic. Still way too much stuff that looks Catholic. The mass has not changed. We still have bishops and archbishops. So much of the Anakin church, to the Puritan point of view, was still Catholic. They wanted a rather simplified Protestantism that resembled Calvin's Geneva. These people became known as Puritans. I think today we have a wrong idea of Puritans. Today we think of Puritans as conservative, hating pleasure of any kind. Uh, Christopher Hill said, if you want to think about what, a, what it was to be a Puritan in the 17th century, you should compare them to a Marxist. The Puritans were prepared to change everything. They had a revolutionary philosophy of life. They wanted to change the church, change society. And in actual fact, uh, the Puritans did go to war. The parliamentary army of the Puritans went to war against the royal army. And, as you may recall, they won. They executed Charles I, and they executed the Archbishop of Canterbury. These are not uh, reticent, dull people. These are people on a mission, confident that they're serving God and bringing necessary change to the Anglican Church of their day. That's Puritanism. Well, these Puritans were, as you can imagine from what I've just described, they were amazing merchants and businessmen. They claimed the liberty to pursue business unhampered by medieval rules of any kind. Money-making could be for the greater glory of God, as Calvin said. Uh, it could be unlimited growth, unlimited success. They did not want to entertain any limits on what they could achieve as merchants and businessmen. And so just to summarize, um, for the Puritan, wealth is a sign of Christian virtue. Poverty is a sign of idleness. See what's happened? The whole thing is switched. Uh, wealth was a dangerous sin in the medieval system. Now it's a virtue. It shows that you are serving God well. Poverty used to be uh, the great virtue, especially for the monks. 
And now for the Puritans, poverty is a sign that you're lazy, you're idle, you're not working as you should. And so, not surprisingly, we have this famous book by Max Weber called The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. And he's saying in an amazing way, we can probably, he, he argued that it's hard to conceive of capitalism ever developing as we have it today without the Calvinists, without the Puritans. They, in fact, prepared the way for a new economic system, and not any economic system, but the economic system of, Calvinism, of, uh, pro, of capitalism. Now, this isn't a theory without challenge, without question. I personally think it's ingenious that he would connect two things that don't seem to have any possible connection. But he said, if you look at capitalism, capitalism is not greed. There's always been greed. Capitalism is a new economic system that has a rationalized labor force, a labor force that's working as efficiently as it possibly can, and that reinvests profits to become even more successful so you can undercut your neighbor and become the only guy standing at the end of the day. Um, those are two features that, that Weber saw in capitalism, and he said in an amazing way, Puritanism encouraged both those virtues. It encouraged you to work to your best to the honor of God, and encourage you to save and to use your wealth carefully, not to waste it and to spend it on yourself. Well, those things are perfect meld. Uh, those virtues are a perfect meld for what you need to be a good capitalist. So I think there's something to this. I'm, I'm not saying that he's right at every point, um, but uh, that was Max Weber's argument over 100 years ago. And, uh, and it still gets a lot of attention. So, the Puritans said, you need to follow your vocation with as much enthusiasm as possible. You will never waste your money. You'll reinvest it uh, in the best possible rational way. Now that brings me to my final paradigm, and that is German pietism. Uh, the pietists are a kind of a German equivalent of the English Puritans in the 17th century. And um, it happens to be my own field of study. I brought along a couple of my books if you want to peruse them on an introduction to German pietism. Pietists encouraged new birth, Bible study, social activism, and millennialism and Christian missions. As you may know, the reformers themselves were convinced that the end of the world was near, the last judgment was near, they had no motivation to be missionaries, Luther and Calvin. The Puritans and the pietists were really the beginnings of modern Protestant missions in the 17th century as post-millennialists. Now, a famous scholar named Carl Hendricks has observed that if, on the one hand, English Puritanism seems to provide the groundwork for capitalism, it's in Germany that we have the groundwork of socialism. And probably part of that was pietism, which is interesting. One of these movements seems to lead to capitalism. The other seems to lead to socialism. Puritanism sanctified work for its own sake. Pietism sanctified work if it was for the sake of others. Puritans looked at their own individual su success. Pietists worked to improve the social conditions of their neighbor in the world. The Calvinists saw only the depravity of the poor. The pietists saw the poor as people that should be helped so they could eventually survive on their own successfully. So over against Puritan's individualist economic ethic, pietism had an altruistic, a community ethic. So this is all from Carl Hinrichs in a book he wrote some decades ago. So the pietist thinks of his hard work as part of a social duty, as part of a community duty. <coughs> One of the great heroes of this early pietism was August Hermann Franke. And in 1698, he built an amazing orphanage for over a thousand children in Halle, Germany. That building still stands. In fact, I was there just uh, last fall. Franke called upon the authorities, the state, to use its res resources to help the poor and the orphan. Franke himself did all he could to establish schools and orphanages for the good of the poor and the orphan. So, in a sense, I'm not saying this is airtight, but in a sense you can see how some of these features might be seen as, as a resource for, for socialism. 
I find it interesting that one of the founders of Marxism, Frederick Engels, was raised in a pietist family in Germany. His father was a, a prosperous pietist Lutheran in Wuppertal, Germany. And actually, he, by this time, pietists weren't so pious. They had lost that ethic and had become good capitalists. And Frederick Engels became so disillusioned by his father's behavior as a merchant that he lost his faith. And, of course, the rest is history. Frederick Engels said in a letter that he observed that of all the factory owners, the pietists treated their workers the worst. So by this time, that original vision of Franca has been lost. And so the pietism that uh, Friedrich Engels learned was of a capitalism that was selfish and merciless and not caring about the neighbor. And so I conclude that now with pietism, at least with the pietism of Franca, we go back to the notion, notion of community service, social duty to the poor, poor relief, orphanages, this kind of vision. So I hope, I hope I've got you thinking. This is quite a trajectory I've taken you through. Uh, we've landed, I think, at the point where I can now turn things over to, uh, to David, and uh, he will bring all the threads together and uh, tell us the truth. <laughs> that was great. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, uh, Doug, for inviting me. Thanks to the chair and Christian Thought for having me. Uh, thank you for hosting this. Thanks to Westside Kings uh, for giving us a location and cookies, which is fantastic. Um, so I am about to talk to you about religion and money, which are two of the four things my mother told me not to talk about with people <laughs> who I don't know and in polite company, and you all seem very polite. So I want to just apologize in advance <laughs> if I inadvertently offend anyone or if I misspeak at any point. Uh, I'm really genuinely honored to be here, uh, to have an opportunity to share with you a little bit of what I know and also to learn from you because I think this is just a fascinating, fascinating topic. Um, but if I misspeak or inadvertently offend anyone, as I can just hear my mother saying, what are you doing talking of religion and money, what? Right, so let me just apologize in advance should I misspeak or inadvertently offend anyone. Um, so, uh, Doug has done a fantastic job of setting us up with a very complex picture of several hundred years of Christian thinking about the relationship between money and wealth. Um, and I come from this, I come at this from a different perspective. Um, my primary appointment is in the philosophy department, and I teach a class called the philosophy of money, where one of my primary interests is the ethics of charity and the ethics of wealth. So, um, I want to start with that discussion um, and draw it through what I originally thought was the Christian perspective on this, but as Doug has already shown us, it's much more interesting than that. So um, here's where I'd like to start. In 1971, uh, a philosopher named Peter Singer wrote an article that basically changed the way modern English-speaking philosophers think about the ethics of wealth and charity. Um, prior to Singer's article, I think it was very common for pretty much any philosopher thinking about morality or thinking about the ethics of any kind of activity, they would have used charity as the classic example of something that was super erogatory, which I promise is the only word like that I'm going to use tonight. But it's a technical term, and the super means above the obligation. So the idea was that for you to engage in charity, freely giving away your money to other people who might need it, you were doing something that was good and deserved praise, but you weren't doing anything that you were required to do. You were doing something above and beyond your obligation. You were doing something super erogatory instead of obligatory. So prior to 1971, I'm sure anybody doing moral theory who wanted to explain the concept of super erogation, they would say, you know, it's like charity. It's nice if I give somebody $5, but if I fail to, I haven't done anything wrong. It's above my obligation. Well, Singer wrote this article in 1971 called Famine, Affluence, and Morality, 
where he wanted to argue that in fact, for lots of kinds of charity, failing to give was an active wrong rather than just failing to do something that would be nice but not worthy of blame if you failed to do it. So Singer's famous example runs like this. Get ready to feel bad about yourself. Uh, suppose on your way here tonight, after uh, our light snowfall and melt, you happen across a pond or a puddle where there is a small child drowning. And you happen to be the only person there who sees the child, and you look over at the child and you say, that kid looks like they're in trouble. I could probably help them out if I just went over and picked them up, but I did just buy new shoes. And these shoes are, I mean, very nice, let's face it. And if I step into the puddle, I'm gonna ruin my shoes. So sorry, kid, I have to go. <laughs> well, if you do that, and you judge your nice new pair of shoes as more valuable than the life of this child that is in danger, pretty intuitively, you have done something monstrous. You have committed an active moral wrong by privileging a material good over a human life. And then Singer draws the quick conclusion to say, well, look, you might think that you were lucky having not walked by <laughs> any drowning children while wearing fancy shoes. Um, but in fact, given the way the world is globally connected now, you do this all day, every day, when you decide to allocate wealth to yourself that could be given to charitable causes that would actively save lives. So if you believe that leaving the child in the pond would be wrong for the sake of saving your shoes, you also ought to believe every time you decide to buy yourself an extra fancy dinner, a luxury watch, a new pair of shoes, you have not done something that it would have been nice had you not done it, you're doing something that is an active moral evil. Let's all take a moment and feel bad about ourselves. <laughs> I can feel especially bad because Doug was kind enough to take me to dinner tonight, and he bought me a very nice dinner. We spent enough money on that dinner, we could have saved really a startling number of lives. So I, I don't here claim uh, to have any sort of special privilege about this, but the argument here is if you are wealthy, if you are showing abundance and showing excess, that is proof that you are doing something wrong so long as there are other people in the world who could be aided or saved by the reallocation of those resources. So here, this is a purely secular argument that Singer is making. He says, look, the argument is if you fail to give to charity and instead allocate extra money to yourself, you're actively doing something wrong. You are failing in your charitable obligations rather than just failing to do something that would have been nice. Now, as you can sort of see, and as the logic of this argument works through your head, you sort of look at your morning coffee and go, oh yeah, that's 10 dead kids. And then you look at something else and go, oh, I can't have those shoes, and like Christmas is gonna be really depressing for the kids, right? So as this logic works for you, you go, okay, that's a really radical conclusion. If I follow Singer's arguments to its logical conclusion, I need to live very, very different. I mean, you all seem well-dressed, so all of you probably could have bought one less nice piece of clothing, right? Um, the idea is that you, could have, you would live very, very differently, and it's a very, very radical conclusion, it seems. So to defend himself against the charge of being too radical and being too out there and socialist, um, Singer invokes St. Thomas Aquinas and says, look, I am proposing something that is out of line with our current moral practices, but I am working in a long and august tradition that says that your excess property is actually the possessions of the poor. So he quotes Aquinas uh, from the Summa Theologica to say that anyone's superabundance is owed to the poor, so the bread you withhold should go to the hungry, the clothes you withhold should go to the naked, and the money you bury in the ground is the freedom of the penniless. So this is Singer's way of saying, look, I know the conclusion seems radical, but I'm not the only one saying this. There is a long and powerful Christian tradition that says exactly the same thing. Um, and if you spend time looking for biblical verses to uh, bear this out, it's pretty easy to find some. So in three of the four Gospels, we are told the story of the rich man we are told the story of a man who comes and says, how shall I get into heaven? And he is told, give away all your possessions and give your riches to the poor because it is harder for a rich man to get into heaven than it is to get a camel through the eye of the needle. 
that seems pretty clearly a condemnation of showing and holding on to extra personal wealth when it could be used to relieve the needs of the poor. Some people have approached this passage, and I did a little research with the help of another one of our colleagues at the university, Dr. Ann Moore, about this passage. And some people have claimed that the eye of the needle is actually just a very narrow passageway that it's totally possible to get a camel through, just a little difficult. So in fact, what that passage means is like, it's kind of irritating to get a rich man into heaven, but you can totally do it, don't worry about it, it's fine, right? Um, it turns out there really is a gate called the Eye of the Needle, but it wasn't built until the 16th century, so it's super unlikely that the passage is actually about that. Um, but exhortations like this show up in all kinds of places in the Bible, and it's a very standard piece of Christian thought. In fact, where we ended with Doug was that the German pietists presumably thought something very, very similar to this. So um, one answer to the question is it permissible to be wealthy, is something along the lines of, it's only permissible to be wealthy so long as no one else is in need. If all the hungry are fed, if all the naked are clothed, and all those needing medical care have it, then go ahead and buy a new pair of shoes. But until that time, your superabundance is owed to the poor. That's what Singer argues for through a sort of ordinary moral philosophical argument. And then he quotes Aquinas and three of the four Gospels. Um, to bear this out. So not only do these answers look sort of overwhelming and compelling, but there's a way that it looks univocal and part of long-standing Christian tradition. But as Doug has just shown us, Christianity is more interesting than that and more varied. Um, and even the book of Matthew gives a different potential scriptural interpretation. So in the book of Matthew in the 19th chapter, you get the camel in the eye of the needle. But then by the 25th chapter, you get the parable of the talents. Uh, and roughly, the parable of the talents is one in which a master has three servants. Uh, a talent is a unit of currency, I assume. Uh, <laughs> and uh, to these three servants, one servant is given five talents, another is given two, and the final one is given one. The two that get multiple talents go out and invest them, and double the, each of them double their money. The one who's only given one buries it into the ground, afraid of losing it. And then when the master returns, he says, good job, you who had five and now has ten. Congratulations, you shall be in charge of this part of my land. Good job, you have two and now have four. You'll be in this charge of my land. Bad job, you who had one and buried it into the ground. You did it wrong. I'm taking that one from you and giving it to the richest one. So one way of reading the parable of the talents I have seen in the literature about it is as a parable simply about faith. And that here, money is meant to be a stand-in for your faith, and you are not supposed to hide it away. Instead, you are supposed to take it out and multiply it. Um, but what's interesting for the view that wealth is a kind of blessing rather than a kind of sin is in the very Gospel of Matthew, you have two different interpretive passages, and it seems like you have to interpret at least one of them metaphorically, whichever view you hold. So, as somebody trained primarily as a philosopher, whenever I see a paradox, I get real excited and think, oh, there's, <laughs> here's a thing we need to figure out. Um, so, there's one side of this view that thinks that wealth is a sign of sin. If you have extra money, if you are showing abundance, you are failing to do, you are failing to live up to your obligation to care for the poor, quite frankly. Um, but, there are these other passages in Matthew, um, and these passages in, in Matthew have been used uh, and are part of the basis for a movement called the prosperity gospel. So that's the second thing I want to talk about, because this is a distinctively Christian movement um, which thinks not that in being wealthy you are showing evidence of your sinfulness and failure to be charitable, but in being wealthy you are in fact showing how correctly you are aligned with God and how you are in fact blessed and that showing wealth is a kind of blessing. So, um, the, if you are interested in the history of this movement, I simply cannot say enough about this book called Blessed by Dr. Kate Bowler. Um, she is a professor at Duke Divinity School, and she's an excellent historian that sort of traces the prosperity gospel as a distinctive American and a distinctively Christian movement. Um, so, Bowler traces it back 
to the 1880s in the United States uh, when there were two, this is uh, right, there were sort of two uh, of many different movements starting up. Um, she traces the history of the prosperity gospel, which sees wealth as a kind of blessedness, originally to what was known as the New Thought Movement, um, started and popularized by a preacher named E.W. Kenyon. Kenyon had a very interesting life. He uh, started on the East Coast. He eventually ended up in Washington State around Seattle and had a radio show uh, in which he would talk about New Thought principles. Um, New Thought principles are understood by historians like Dr. Bowler uh, in the following way. Uh, Christian Science, uh, a movement start, founded by Mary Baker Eddy, was gaining popularity at this time. And the Christian scientists, uh, or at least Eddy herself, thought that only the spiritual world was real and that the material world was a kind of illusion. So any kind of ailment or suffering was actually a misalignment of your spiritual self, and so you shouldn't seek medical treatment. Instead, you should endeavor to get yourself spiritually aligned, and then you will be much better. The New Thought movement agreed partly with this um, in that it believed that the world of the spirit and the world of thought was the most real world, but the New Thought movement believed that the material world was also real, but created by the world of thought. So when God created the world, the way he did it was to think it into existence. And according to the advocates of the New Thought movement, God would allow you to participate in this creation by allowing to, you to create some things using your thoughts as well. So one rough idea of the New Thought movement is that thinking positive thoughts will create positive things in your life, and thinking negative thoughts will create negative things in your life. This is where Dr. Bowler traces the origins of the prosperity gospel. So this gets translated through uh, what Bowler calls the Pentecostal mind power movement, and then most crucially, it is taken up in the 1970s and the 1980s uh, known on, in what is known as the word of faith movement, in which the importance of creating positive circumstances is not done through thought, but it's done through the word. So here, you have to actively speak these words in order to create good things in the universe for yourself. Um, and in fact, there are really interesting debates about whether it was possible for deaf people to participate in this if they were unable to ad adequately say these words. Um, and there were arguments about whether they could do it with sign language or not. But here, the primacy of actually speaking the words in order to make it happen um, become very, very important and a foundational part of what we now recognize as the prosperity gospel. So the prosperity gospel very much disagrees with this earlier picture about wealth as a kind of sin. Instead, if you are wealthy, that is evidence according to the prosperity gospel that you are thinking in the correct way, um, that you have not only been saved, but you are involved in the second grace of thinking the correct kind of thoughts, being in alignment with God, and that will be manifested not just in a future life, but in this one right here in which you will gain health and also wealth. So here, according to the prosperity gospel, and here I am, uh, as this book really beautifully shows, I am simplifying a vast group of, uh, you know, interestingly different ideas, but they can be grouped together sociologically. What the prosperity gospel claims is that if you're wealthy, that is actually so a sign of your blessedness. That is a sign that you are doing things correctly. Um, that is a sign that you are living up to what God wants for you, not failing in your charitable obligations. So, you have these two different movements. Um, both of them identifiably Christian, both of them really philosophically interesting. One of which according to, one according to which uh, being wealthy is a sign of a failure, and another according to which being wealthy is a sign of success. So, what's most interesting for me about this is that both of these movements agree that there are obligations from the wealthy to the poor. It's just that they disagree about precisely how to live up to or discharge those obligations. So, if you are of the Singer, Aquinas, Wealth as Sin view, what you ought to do is immediately give, up, give away your possessions and continue giving until there are no more poor people in the world. 
uh, because that's how you will be able to make it through the eye of the needle that will get you into heaven, and that's what is required by your charitable obligations. But instead, if you adhere to the prosperity gospel, and instead think that wealth is a sign of God's blessing, rather than a failure on your part, then you indeed still have a good message to share, but here simply handing someone your wealth is not necessarily going to help them. Because in just the same kind of way, uh, because you're making a mistake, you're trying to fix basically a spiritual problem with a material solution. So instead, it looks like on the prosperity gospel, what your obligation is, in addition to the tithing you need to pay to your church, which comes from the third book of Malachi, which is another, uh, 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 another passage that supports this in the Bible. Um, but in addition to that giving, what you need to give is not money, but knowledge. So what the prosperity gospel teaches is that in order to help the poor, what you need to do is help them to become saved, think correctly, and be able to manifest, using the laws that God himself has laid down, how they can make themselves healthy and wealthy, because, not exactly in a Christian science kind of way, but the rough idea here, if you, uh, if you adhere to a version of what Bowler calls hard prosperity, is that your poverty is a sign of your own misalignment with God. Um, Bowler just uh, divides between hard prosperity and soft prosperity. On hard prosperity, uh, if you are currently poor, that is signs that you are currently out of alignment. Soft prosperity, on the other side, thinks that it's possible for you to be on your way to one place or another, and that things might take time. But in either case, the solution to poverty is to teach people how not to be poor, rather than simply handing them a charitable contribution. So, I'm not going to pretend to know what the resolution to that theological discussion is, but from my perspective, what's so fascinating about it is that there are such interesting uh, and powerfully different justifications for very different responses to the ethics of wealth and the obligations of charity. Um, and I'm especially interested in question time to hear what you have to think about this, uh, because I think you may have seen me scribbling down notes while Doug was talking, but boy, my philosophy of money class just got like 8,000 times better during that, and I expect to learn even more uh, in the question period from all of you. Um, so I will thank you for your time and uh, welcome that now. So thanks very much. Okay, um, I think we'll... Was there any comment you wanted to make in response to mine, or...? Uh, I mean, 8,000 of them, okay. but I will limit myself just to saying how I thought it was historically extremely interesting, uh, the analogy you drew between English Puritanism and Weber's view that that was the foundation for a kind of mm -hmm. uh, capitalism, whereas German pietism was the foundation for a kind of socialism, and those seem to be the historical precursors of the two views I just laid out. One, the idea that if you're just working for yourself, that's a sign of your virtue and lack of idleness, um, versus the idea that if you're not working for others, you're doing something wrong. So I thought that was fascinating. I guess I'm wondering, David, if um, what is the state of the prosperity gospel today? Is it widely accepted in some circles, and what would those circles be? Is it controversial, or how would you, in, in, among Pentecostals, for example? It is. Um, so, it is on an upward trajectory, and here, uh, so it is controversial. There are certainly well-known uh, current pastors who disagree with it. So Rick Hillier, for example, has described it as a heresy. Uh, Hillier himself uh, gives a reverse tithe, so he gives away 90% of his personal wealth every year and thinks that the prosperity gospel is entirely the wrong way to do it. Um, but the diverse groups that uh, Bowler draws together under the umbrella of the prosperity gospel has expanded to millions of adherents uh, and more than 310 churches in just 1990, and it's still on an upward sp swing. And what about the third world? Is it popular there? Uh, it is. It has expanded to the third world even as early as the 1970s. It started as a sort of distinctly American movement, quickly expanded to Canada and then uh, to Mexico, but now it has spread all over the world. Uh, you can find versions of the prosperity gospel in uh, Latin America, in Africa, all over the place. Okay. 
All right, now it's your turn. Uh, there is a mic here that I, I guess I would wish that you would use it right in the center. And you can direct your questions to whomever. <clears throat> Thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, this has been fascinating. I just wanted to know: is there any kind of historical stream that takes in the creation mandate? So you have go forth, multiply, and gain dominion over the earth. And perhaps some of these uh, uh, viewpoints came from just solely a New Testament viewpoint, not based in the. Uh, in the Old Testament creation mandate. So you, you've got gain dominion over the earth, which would imply don't let the earth gain dominion over you. Mm -hmm. uh, so that has something to do with the Protestant work ethic, I would think. Yep. But also uh, the life of Jesus. Was he misaligned because he had no nowhere for the Son of Man to lay his head? Uh, and then the, the temptation he was given uh, in the wilderness to worship Satan and he would be given material goods and power. And so I, I think there might be some correctives there, but uh, is there any uh, particular author you would recommend that would go take that tact? I can take a stab at it. Sure. Um, so that's a really uh, interesting question. Um, the most advocates of the prosperity gospel, the modern prosperity gospel that, uh, that Bowler and others have um, um, described, don't typically view themselves as involved so much in a historical, scriptural, or textual tradition as much as they are um, achieving revelations. So they wouldn't identify themselves in most cases uh, as coming out of the kind of historical stream that a historian might identify. Interestingly enough, the prosperity gospel splits um, on the question of Jesus' own life um, because there's one side that wishes to claim that Jesus was in fact actually quite wealthy and that's just not obvious to us as modern readers. So the fact that uh, Mary rode a donkey, that is compared to Mary riding in a Cadillac. Some authors claim that Jesus in fact wore very fashionable designer clothes. Uh, and so one, one view is that Jesus himself was definitely not misaligned because there are just features of the text that we are missing out on or misunderstanding. That's one side that the prosperity preachers will so sometimes go with. The other side actually says that it's part of Christ's suffering to live a life of poverty. So it's not that he's misaligned, but he is taking on... So poverty itself is a kind of suffering or even a, it's sometimes even described as a kind of demonic possession that Christ took on as a sin and a kind of suffering, and he took it on so that his followers would not have to. So, but what's most interesting there is that the, the preachers of the prosperity gospel can go either way on that question and find a way to try to integrate the story into their theology. I'll address the first part of your comment about the Old Testament argument from being fruitful, multiplying. Um, that was very attractive to the Calvinist persuasion and to the Puritans. And they would also look at, at, at I believe, the Eighth Commandment, Thou shalt not steal. Um, in, in the uh, Westminster Catechism, the argument is, well, that means you should do nothing to hinder your neighbor's uh, progress to a state of wealth. It's, it kind of becomes a kind of millionaire's charter. Um, gov governments or nobody should prevent anybody else from becoming wealthy. That's the spirit of the Eighth Commandment. So yes, there were ap appeals to the Old Testament. Other comments, questions? I would just like to make a comment on what you were already talking about. But in the question of poverty and wealth, very early in our history, I know that the terms poverty and wealth were decreed about the people's lack of understanding of Jesus or lack of faith in Jesus or when they were wealthy was when they had a very strong belief in Jesus and it was this part of it that was spiritual in our lives but all the terms of poverty and wealth 
have now moved to factual things like money, when money nowadays is far more interesting and useful than wisdom is. But uh, I think it's very important that we understand that the lack of, of uh, the faith in Jesus is poverty, and the having a very strong feeling of Jesus is wealthy. Okay, thank you, David. Which one did you think had the good idea? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, if, I, I believe your question was, um, what connection or development is there between the Puritans and the Pietists, considering that they're almost contemporary, and how do you get one arising from the other? Um, I guess the answer would be that they're really in different contexts. And so, um, I mean, it's actually a big question not just on the issue of wealth, but theology and missions, and in many areas, people compare the pietists with the Puritans. But I think it is interesting that in their different contexts, they do seem to come to some very different conclusions. Um, in the British context, and Tawny thinks that in Britain, you have the fastest arrival at a kind of a secular approach to wealth of any European country. And... Um, he thinks, well, he gives a, a variety of reasons for that, one of them maybe being the, the revolution, the civil war um, in the 17th century. For a variety of reasons, people very much feel put up to their own resources. They're on their own. Individualism reigns supreme. I mean, a spiritual version of this would be John Bunyan in his autobiography. Many, many people are feeling very lonely on their own in England. In Germany, it's not the same situation uh, at all. Um, for one thing, politically it's very different. Germany is a patchwork of principalities. I think the sense of community maybe is, is somewhat stronger. There is no, I mean, there is the Thirty Years' War, which was an awful experience of, of uh, conflict and tragedy that, if anything, I think threw people upon each other for, for help. But there are different contexts. I mean, another comparison is in terms of their approach to... Uh, to, to black Americans and slavery. Uh, Puritans didn't seem to have a big problem with slavery. And when the Pietists arrived in Pennsylvania, they did have a problem with slavery. So it's interesting that these contemporaries come from very different places, and there is no logical explanation for that, I guess I would say. It's a good question. I'm perhaps going to open a, a much larger kettle of worms that may require an expert in a different area. But uh, what I've heard tonight sounds very much like we have the medieval synthesis, then we have the Reformation, and then it goes on from there. Whereas, of course, the, the Roman Catholic Church today, and indeed the Anglican Church today that the Puritans were uh, execrating, um, are still very large and thriving denominations. And I would like to know if either of them have taken up elements of this dichotomy between the two. Of course, we have Pope Francis's talking about poverty. Is he going back to a medieval conception, or is he picking up on, on some of these uh, prosperity gospel things that are very prominent in the third world? Wow. Want to jump in? That's an excellent question. Um, I don't want to get, I don't want to get out of my depth here. I mean, I, I do find the responses to Pope Francis I, the responses in North America very interesting. Um, and lead us, needless to say, a lot of North American conservatives are not happy with Francis. Um, so that speaks to me that even Roman Catholics. So it speaks to me that, that's, that the ideals that Francis represents that I think are very much the ideals I was talking about, um, wealth is to be shared, um, have been lost among North American Christians, and it sounds like a foreign philosophy. Um, Francis is not popular among a lot of conservative North American Catholics, right? So that's an interesting phenomenon. I, I could say just a little bit about that um, in terms of how I think that it relates to the prosperity gospel, because one thing that 
accounts for the spread of the, the prosperity gospel is uh, it was claimed that as the theology got vaguer, it was easier for it to transmit. The fewer things you needed to sort of agree to specifically, the easier it was for it to spread. And it's such an American movement that many historians look at it as sort of tied up with a kind of American triumphalism as well. And so it's not really restricted to any particular theology because you will find many other people saying very similar things, just not theologically inflected. And so I think there's a way that the prosperity gospel is as much, well, the, the prosperity movement is as much a cultural phenomenon as it is a religious phenomenon. And from my perspective, I see uh, Pope Francis reacting to that. And so it's not surprising that he would be unpopular among even North American Catholics who are part of that very movement. Um, I'm not a historian of Christianity by any means, but it, it's, it's a really interesting question about whether that, the current Pope Francis's discussions of poverty, whether he is tying into a precedent or not. Because he's Pope Francis the first. He's the first ever to name himself uh, after St. Francis, but St. Francis is a saint, uh, and part of the reason he chose that name was because of St. Francis's, I mean, very radical view that you could not be wealthy uh, and pious at the same time. From what I understand, uh, St. Francis was pretty irritating to be around because he just had one set of clothes and he never washed uh, and encouraged you to do the same because he so radically believed that any kind of excess you allocated to yourself was a kind of sinfulness. I had a question about the prosperity gospel, kind of more specifically about congregations that may be around. Um, practically, how does that look like uh, for them? Are the people who are more wealthy considered more spiritual and become the leaders in those congregations? And would they, if there was a, uh, a congregation in a wealthy part of town and another congregation in a, you know, a tougher part of town, would the one congregation think themselves as more superior or more spiritual than the other congregation where people are naturally not as prosperous? That's a great question. Um, I think uh, there has been a historical turn from the 1980s. So there there's, was really sort of a moment between 1970 to about 1990 when many prosperity churches practiced what has been described as hard prosperity. So if you are not currently wealthy, you are therefore not currently spiritually aligned or that is a sign of a kind of viciousness. And that view about hard prosperity would take the view that you've just described. So if you, the, the fact that you are a wealthy church, wealthier church in a wealthier part of town is itself evidence that you are more pious, more holy, doing things better, better aligned. The gospel of soft prosperity, which is really where it has gone since about 1990, um, isn't committed to that necessarily as a premise. Uh, because there the idea is that the causal relationships between your virtue and your piety and your material circumstances can be sort of longer and more convoluted. So it is possible on that view for you to have wealth right now that you're just about to lose because you're no longer doing, doing good, or you could currently be impoverished but on your way to wealth. And I think, I think, uh, I think that second thing, because it is, it, it's a triumphal message more than anything else, I think it's that second thing that really characterizes modern prosperity gospel preachers who take the view that, well, even if you're not wealthy now, um, you could be on the path right now. You may indeed already be on the path, so stay on it and work with it, um, which is much more amenable to the view uh, that would reject the view that if just you're in a poor part of town, you must be evil or degenerate or something. <clears throat> yeah, I'm wondering if um, equality is considered, uh, uh, that, that hasn't come up here. I mean, I don't ta take equality in general to be important. I mean, it depends on which kind of equality. In some ways, we should all have equal rights. But if one person works twice as hard as the other and earns more money as a result, well, you know, it's kind of their own doing, too. Um, recognizing some people are uh, handicapped through no fault of their own as well and perhaps need additional assistance. But some people in the Bible, for example, Job uh, and also the Apostle Paul went through both poverty and wealth. Like Paul, uh, just looking up Philippians 4.12, he talks about learning to be content whether he's in hungry or, yeah. you know, 
and hunger or want or plenty. He, uh, yeah, in Philippians 4.12, Paul makes it clear that he's been through both kinds and he's learned to be content whether he's in, you know, uh, has, has abundance or is lacking abundance. And Job, you get Job starting out rich, going through poverty and difficulty, and then ending up twice as rich in the end. And so you've got examples of people in the Bible where their godliness, one Old Testament, one New Testament example I've given, is in no way tied to whether they happen to be, at one point in their life, more wealthy than another point, and at some other point they're, they're in poverty. Like either way, it doesn't say anything uh, negative about, you know, Paul after his conversion or Job. Yeah. Not that they didn't have weaknesses and shortcomings, but mm -hmm. the degree of their wealth didn't have any um, direct correlation to the degree of their godliness. Uh -huh. yeah, that's a good point. Thank you, Andrew. I could just say one thing about equality, if I might. Um, one thing that's interesting uh, here's an ad for my very exciting talk about Lockean theories of property tomorrow. Uh, is that one way of characterizing the view that wealth is a kind of sinfulness is not that, in all the ways I've described them, the idea is not that it is intrinsically bad to be wealthy, it's just bad to be wealthy when other people are impoverished. So there, it's not a requirement that everyone have absolutely equal amounts of wealth, it just is a requirement that everyone has a minimum standard, after which it's plausible to think that there might be inequalities among people. First of all, thanks for coming to speak with us tonight. It's very informative. I um, wanted to ask, when it came to the prosperity gospels, do you find that they contain reasonable perspective within, um, within the bigger picture of what you're looking at? And at the same time, have you found any sub substantial publications outside of them that would help to ensure that perspective? I mean, that's a very interesting question um, because it's going to depend on what you, th what you define as reasonable and what you think the larger context is here. So um, there are some publications and there are certainly some preachers of the prosperity gospel who don't seem particularly reasonable and actually don't even seem particularly sincere. There are versions of preachers of the prosperity gospels who just seem to be um, con artists, basically, who are claiming the prosperity gospel in a way of getting donations, and then later, it later comes to light that they're involved in all kinds of tax frauds and difficult problems like that, and that they sincerely don't believe it themselves. So it's a mantle that is sometimes taken up by specific preachers in a way that I think is disingenuous. But I don't think that that's the majority of the cases. There are more than, there were, in 1990 there were 310 of them, and I think there are many more than that now. And I think that there are both secular and religious versions of the prosperity gospel that make it at least plausible, if not necessary. So hard prosperity, the view that your current material circumstances are an immediate and perfect reflection of your piety or your psychological alignment, that's a hard doctrine for me to find reasonable because it seems like there are so many potential counterexamples to that. But a doctrine of soft prosperity, understood in a larger religious context, um, seems plausible, and it also seems plausible just in a psychological context um, through a variety of studies and other things like that. So depending on what you mean by reasonable, I do think that there are versions of it that can be made to make sense, um, but I think that's hard for hard prosperity. And there's somebody, go ahead, Gord. Uh, just a question on a, a completely different angle for a minute, and it has to do with taxation. Um, so in the U.S., in the uh, election uh, about to happen in the next year, uh, Bernie Sanders, I think, is proposing a 90% tax rate for wealthy people. And, and we've seen uh, people proposing increased taxation on the wealthy in Canada and in the province here, of course, too. And I'm wondering whether or not uh, the prosperity gospel people, uh, on the one hand, would say, well, the way to deal with uh, poverty issues is through the government primarily because poverty is a systemic issue. You can deal with systemic issues better through the government than you can any other way. 
So I'm okay with increased taxation as far as the government's concerned, but stay away from my personal private wealth because that's really not the way to address poverty issues anyway. And I'm wondering whether or not the, the pietists, modern day pietists, would, would have a view of that as well, that it's not so much how we personally deal with our own individual bank accounts, but more how we deal with taxation and whether we're in favor of pushing more taxation or less taxation, yeah. and one of those is more spiritual than the other. So could you comment on both aspects of that? Please. Uh, there are those who see the pietist gourd as, as the beginnings of the modern welfare state. Um, I mean, even, even Franca did not hesitate to go to his prince and to, and the prince then established a tax system that would support the orphanages that Franca was establishing. So Franca went directly to the government. And uh, in fact, uh, the prince, uh, Frederick I, even allowed the pietists to go door to door once a year. Uh, besides anything the governments were going to provide to do the additional thing and, and to look for personal charity. But clearly they, they had no hesitation in seeing the government as a main agent in this. So I think you're, you're right about that. Um, I think the attitude to taxation is an interesting one. I, uh, we didn't, that wasn't central to our presentations, but it's a fascinating one for us to think about. Um, you know, I heard a, a presentation some years ago at U of C that essentially said we shouldn't care if we have high taxes, um, if it's going to mean it, the social good of our country. And, uh, of course, we've had a, a government that's had a very different perspective on that. So what is a Christian view of taxation? Boy, that's a loaded one. And I think the pietists would say, there's nothing wrong with paying taxes if it's a way of caring for the orphan and the poor. I could say a little about the prosperity gospel since you asked. Um, I would find it extremely surprising if most advocates of the prosperity gospel were advocates of higher taxation to advocate, to, to deal with those kinds of problems. Um, now, that's not to say that advocates of the prosperity gospel are against giving. They are in favor of tithing to their churches, and those churches can then in turn deal with these systemic issues, but typically that's not part of the prosperity gospel's message. Interestingly enough, I think there is a plausibly Christian view about taxation. If you come to my talk tomorrow about John Locke, I can tell you, and indeed I will tell you, that Locke's view has it, contrary to many American Locke scholars, that no government that allows people to starve, be hungry, or be lacking in medicine can be a legitimate government. So if there are those problems that the state is not taking care of, the state is thereby illegitimate. Locke would have um, voted how? <laughs> Whig. Um, I hate to say it, but you're jumping the line. There are two people ahead of you. Um, you asked, uh, mentioned the uh, Christian attitude towards taxation. In a modern state, big and complex issues, you pointed out that an individual handing out loonies on the street can't solve the poverty problem. And so we have large systemic programs by the government. When I think of the uh, mosaic tithing 10%. Well, uh, that covers a lot of the welfare programs that the federal government is taxing us for. Mm. So I suppose tax evasion mm -hmm. is not doing your share. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, who's next in line? <laughs> oh. uh, Dr. Dick, I'm wondering if you can comment specifically a little bit more about um, uh, maybe in light of the history that uh, uh, was laid out earlier uh, in regards to some of your research you've done on happiness in terms of how wealth uh, can influence uh, happiness, in particular how your view of charity in relation to your wealth can influence your happiness. Sure, I'd be delighted. Let me talk about my favorite study of all time. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so there's very interesting psychological literature about the relationship between income and happiness. 
Uh, there is a study done by now two Nobel Prize winning economists. Uh, the other author of the study just won the Nobel Prize this year. Um, but it was a giant survey of 400,000 Americans trying to separate out how their income related to two different questions. So the first question was the ladder question. The ladder question asks you, where are you? So imagine your life is a ladder, 10 is your best life, zero is your worst life. Where are you on that ladder today? It turns out as far as they were able to study, answers to the latter question got better and better and better as household, uh, household income went up in an almost perfectly 45 degree angle. There is another set of questions, however, called the emotional well-being questions. These questions are, they call you up and they say, did you laugh today, did you cry today, did you smile today, were you alone today? Answers to those questions got better and better and better up to household incomes of $75,000 a year, and then they just went flat. So above $75,000 a year, you're, you will, you're laughing as much as money can buy you, you're crying as little as money can buy you, uh, and you're, you are as not alone as money can buy you. Um, but above that, there's just no gains. So this study um, is wonderfully interesting, incredibly rigorous on a giant sample, and it usually gets picked up in the media as the $75,000 study, that money buys happiness up to $75,000 and not beyond. <laughs> it, it doesn't quite say that, and the reason it's my favorite study is because it's wonderful economic research that leaves us with a philosophical question, which is, well, do I want to evaluate my life better on a higher and higher numerical scale, or do I want to just, you know, smile and laugh as much as I can and then maybe help out other people? Um, so I think it's a really, really interesting study, but there's very good reason to believe that above about $75,000 a year household income, there won't be emotional gains, but you could really help other people out you know, emotionally by increasing their wealth uh, above a certain level. Um, but it's still a philosophical question which one of those two you want to do. Thank you both. Um, that was very interesting. Uh, something that Dr. Shantz had commented on uh, your talk um, was his question about uh, the third world and how prosperity gospels work there. And so that really makes me curious in terms of how does that become appropriated by the people there given the circumstances of many of them living in poverty. And whereas I could see like a liberation theology uh, naturally growing up because it's a mes message of hope and liberation, um, prosperity gospel seems more uh, a message of condemnation. And so I'm wondering if it, maybe someone else uh, had asked a somewhat similar question. Is it the soft prosperity that's kind of grown up that sort of aids in that help? Um, or is it something else that makes it become popular there? Hmm. I mean, it's really interesting that you would characterize it as a kind of theology of condemnation. But there is a way that one logical consequence of some of the doctrines are that your poverty is in some respect your fault. Um, I am, met, I am not an expert about the, uh, I'm, 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 uh, I'm not an expert at all about the expansion of the prosperity gospel to the third world, but uh, from what little I do know, it, looks, it, is a modern, it is a more modern contemporary movement, so it's a kind of soft prosperity gospel. Um, and uh, in this discussion, uh, actually, um, uh, Boulder begins her book with uh, a cautionary note that says, uh, the language of the prosperity gospel and the language, the, the, the rhetoric of wealth and health is understood by most North American interpreters as uh, wealth and health in superabundance. Um, but for many people engaged in and following the prosperity gospel, what prosperity is is actually subsistence. And so what you're actually achieving uh, is, right, slightly, what counts as prosperity for you is also going to sort of be very culturally and context sensitive. Um, so I imagine in the places, I imagine in the places it's expanding there, what counts as prosperity looks very different, and it d is not the, the other thing is the, you can derive that condemnation from this by looking at the doctrines and sort of thinking about them and seeing what they imply. But that message is never a part of the rhetoric or the sermons. It is a message of hope and a message of triumph and a message of what's possible for you and here is the pathway to achieve it. Okay, so, 
Thanks. And the last part I forgot to add was um, you had mentioned it is knowledge that is given to the poor to rise, raise themselves up. And so how does that also work in a context of poverty? Um, and that's all. I mean, uh, roughly the idea is that uh, the knowledge that's transmitted is you don't just simply hand someone and try to get them out of their poverty by transmitting wealth to them. Instead, you transmit to them the message of how they themselves can be aligned, think positively, and gain wealth for themselves. Interestingly enough, a crucial part of that message begins with giving some of your wealth away. There's a, a language of sowing and reaping where in order for things to come back to you 10 or 100 fold, you need to give some of it away. So if someone is poor enough, you might actually have to give them some sort of startup capital in order to get the prosperity gospel going. But that's roughly the idea. Hi. Hi. <laughs> that was a long wait. Um, I, guess, I guess I'm wondering, I mean, I, I I'm quite familiar with the prosperity gospel. I've certainly been to, you know, spent a lot of time in a church that uh, spent a lot of time in that headspace. Um, I'm wondering if we go beyond that to more of a social justice sort of attitude that seems to be um, more prevalent lately. I, I don't know if you agree. I, I mean, I see it struggling to pop up. And I guess what I'm wondering is... Um, in terms of tying it back to a biblical basis, um, is, is there anyone looking at some of the old um, economic laws and, and what a difference they could make to um, public policy and social justice today? Things like, um, uh, you know, not harvesting to the margins and, and, uh, not, and usury, not charging interest on loans and all that kind of thing. Does that, does that tie into anything, any studies that are going on today? And, and is anyone looking into that in terms of social justice? Do you know? I can say a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, I mean, <laughs> so my, my perspective on this is going to be a little idiosyncratic because I'm originally American. And so when I moved to Canada, everything seemed like social justice all the time. Uh, because everybody has health care, everybody, right? It's, so indeed, I have perceived more social justice in the last six years since I moved here. Um, but I don't know if my perception of that is really a reliable one about the movements, uh, about, you know, in particular theological places. Um, I don't necessarily see that kind of social justice urge coming up in the churches identified as the prosperity gospel. Those, those tend to be much more in line with the English Puritans, that wealth is an individual affair, that in many ways uh, taking care of yourself is your own business, and here is the path for you to be able to do it. Um, but interestingly, the, so the, old, the old economic laws are really fascinating, and I don't know if anybody is doing... Uh, any work on them right now to see how they might be uh, reapplied. Uh, but so there was, there was the tradition of Jubilee, which that every seven years all debts were forgiven, um, which is in one way is a very progressive social justice uh, movement. But the flip side to Jubilee was that all debts are forgiven and all property reverts to its original owners. So that's the sort of thing where all the wealth goes back to the original holders who had it, and so that law is in some ways social justice progressive, in some ways not otherwise. Usury is fascinating. Let me come back and talk to you for 12 hours about usury. Uh, because originally the prohibition on usury descending through Aquinas, there are arguments in Aristotle against it, was a prohibition on charging at interest at all. Um, modern prohibitions on usury are about charging excessive interest in most cases. But there was a movement in the 1800s from great utilitarians like Jeremy Bentham who wrote a book called The Defense of Usury. And it's very plausible to think that allowing people to access loans at relatively low levels of interest is what helps create a middle class and move a lot of people out of poverty. So the laws on usury are long and complicated and fascinating. Um, and complicated because I don't think, right, certainly I think there are kinds of usury that are really problematic and work to keep people in poverty and are very problematic, but the original prohibition was on lending an interest at all and prohibiting that prevents a kind of social mobility. 
Well, I think weren't the laws on not charging, you weren't allowed to charge interest within the nation of Israel. If you loaned money outside of that, you, you could charge interest, but you could not charge interest to the poor. Uh, yes. Am, no. am I remembering that right? No, that, that's entirely right. Um, th that got it. Come to my 12-hour lecture on usury next okay. year. Because that, I mean, <laughs> that, that passage Because I'm has... fascinated by this and what it would look like today. And I'm wondering, has nobody, has there not an economist anywhere who's ever looked at, what if, what if this is actually how it went today? What, what kind of social impact would that have? Um, interestingly enough, m the work I know about on those sorts of questions uh, is work around Islamic banking. Because uh, many um, versions of Islam forbid uh, still hold a complete prohibition on usury. And so they try to create, there are economists who try to create um, financial vehicles that allow mm -hmm. people to sort of get something that's kind of like a mortgage on a home but doesn't count like a mortgage on a home. And they are trying actively to use older economic laws to apply to modern circumstances. But I, and this may just be my ignorance, I don't know anybody doing it from an Old Testament or a New Testament perspective. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think we better make this next question the last. Just, he's been waiting for a while, but anyway. Um, just back to history for a, a moment. I wish if you'd comment on uh, one of the connections between the English scene after the Puritans and the German scene is in the figure of John Wesley, who once said, earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. And I just would, if you could comment on sort of the legacy and influence of Wesley in the uh, kind of scene afterwards, including North America, where he's extremely influential. That's a really good question. Um, in some ways, Wesley resembles the pietists, and there are good reasons for that. But when you think of the Wesleyans, you think of their classes. You think of the class was like, we would call it a, uh, a care group. And they cared for one another in, in many ways, spiritually, economically. And so I think in many ways, the Wesleyans are, are really going against uh, the Puritans, going against the individualism and creating a pietist concern for the neighbor, a pietist sense of community where they cared for each other. Um, and that is because there was a close connection between Wesley and the pietists. Sir, you said you've been waiting a long time? Yes, may I, may I okay. just... May I just offer a, a comment rather than a question? Uh, I think f four or five times the w expression third world was used today. Uh, uh, let me legitimate my, legitimize my assertion by saying I have done some research on the use of the phrase the third world. Uh, the fact of the matter is uh, the the concept of third world was invented in the 1960s in, in Paris. Uh, the first world was the prosperous nations of, uh, of uh, Western Europe and North America. The second world was uh, the Soviet Union, its satellites and China and so on. And the third world consisted of Asia, Africa and Latin America. Mm. Now, even as the phrase became became uh, popular, people pointed out that there was considerable difference within these continents in wealth, in achievement, in education, any number. And yet, the word the third world seemed to be uh, very uh, you, a useful handle for particularly Western uh, writers and scholars. And the, the most uh, the most um, difficult or most um, uh, difficult use of the phrase in journalism was referring to the native people of Canada and uh, of uh, and of United States as living in third world conditions, as though as though the third world conditions should uh, should not exist by itself. But as, as has been said many times, third world is a misnomer. It should not be used. It'll be like saying Pope Francis did not come from Argentina. He <laughs> came from the third world. <laughs> You've been a wonderful audience tonight. It's been a pleasure. I think David, I can speak for David as well. It's been a pleasure to, uh, 
participate this evening in this exchange, and I want to thank you for coming. Um, I have planned an event uh, for February relating to physician-assisted suicide, a uh, big topic in our society in Canada, so look for the advertisement for that uh, in February. Thanks for coming. Thank you.